to record us going through these notes. And as always, if you want to go back in the future and look at the video that we're about to go through, rewatch me going through these notes. Today, we're talking about the laws of motion. So really getting in, into the physics side of IPC. So that'll be posted up under our Zoom class video section on the Google Classroom. Opening. Oh, I said Google and my phone freaked out for a second. Okay. So today we're going over the laws of motion, which are sort of universal laws that govern and tell us about how objects should move and what sorts of forces are going to be, we're going to be dealing with when we're looking at objects in motion. So we'll go ahead and jump into the notes for today. All right, our laws of motion also known as the Newtonian laws of motion for this guy down here, Isaac Newton, who most people are familiar with the story that an apple fell from a tree and hit him on the head or fell down to the ground close to him. And that's how he started coming up with the idea of gravity, which is something else that he developed. But these laws of motion are sort of even more fundamental, even more bedrock than that. So they're called Newton's laws of motion and there are three of them. The first two we'll go over today and then the third one we'll cover on Thursday because it's kind of a little bit more complicated than the other two. So like I mentioned, they're called this because of the guy who developed them, Isaac Newton, was a mathematician back in the early to mid 1600s, I think. And if you ask a lot of scientists and a lot of people, they'll say that Isaac Newton is probably one of, if not the smartest person ever to have existed. Um, his work is developed some of the sort of most fundamental laws and rules that govern physics and math that we still use on a daily basis today. So super, super smart, super important guy. And in terms of physics, his kind of greatest contribution is these three basic laws of motion. Hey, Dasani, good to see you. Thanks for jumping on board with us. Welcome yeah, hey, hi. to class. All right, so laws of motion. There is the law of inertia, there is the force equation, and then there is the law of action reaction. So like I mentioned earlier, today we're gonna go through these first two laws on inertia and force. And then on Thursday, we'll cover the action reaction law. It's a little bit more complicated and requires a little bit more explaining. So if you write them out and they're big, fancy kind of verbiage, it looks something like this. Newton's first law of motion that we'll be talking about today is that an object at rest, meaning like not moving at all, will stay at rest and an object in motion will stay in motion at constant velocity unless they are acted upon by an unbalanced force. And again, we're gonna spend a whole bunch of time talking about what all of these different parts mean today. Second law of motion is pretty simple. Force equals mass times acceleration. The force that an object is going to produce is equal to that object's size, its mass, times its acceleration, how quickly it speeds up or slows down. Then the third law, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Every force that you exert against an object that object exerts a force back on you. And we'll talk a lot more about what exactly equal and opposite means on Thursday. 
All right. So Newton's first law, object at rest, meaning not moving at all, staying completely still, will stay at rest and an object in motion will stay in motion unless acted upon by an unbalanced force, sometimes called an outside force. So there's a lot of kind of new words, new verbs in here. What exactly does this mean? What do we mean when we talk about stay at rest or stay in motion or unbalanced forces? So essentially, this first law is saying that an object will keep doing exactly what it was doing at the same reaction in the same direction and the same speed, unless some sort of new force comes in and is exerted on it. And so by force, we mean something that alters the motion of an object. So when you push or pull something, or when you blow on something, or when something vibrates or shakes, that's due to a force being exerted. So if an object was sitting still, it's going to remain stationary, right? If I have this computer that you're watching me through the screen of right now is sitting on my desk. And if I don't touch my computer, if nothing happens to my computer, it'll keep sitting on my desk in the exact same spot until something comes along and moves it. It can't move by itself and it's not gonna be moved by some unknown impossible like magic, right? It will only move if something acts on it. So essentially, as long as this house keeps standing and this desk is in good shape and my computer stays on top of it, it'll stay in this exact spot until the end of time, right? Nothing is gonna move this computer until a force is exerted on it. It's gonna keep doing what it was gonna do. It's gonna stay in that exact spot. If something is moving at a constant velocity, it will keep moving. So in a little bit, we'll talk about why this doesn't exactly work here on Earth, because we have things like air resistance and friction. But imagine if you're deep in outer space, far away from all the planets and stuff, space doesn't have any air or any friction in it. And you take a tennis ball and you exert a force and you throw that tennis ball away from you. And it's heading away from you at 11 miles an hour. That tennis ball is gonna keep going at 11 miles an hour forever until something acts upon it, until some sort of new force acts upon it, until it hits something or gravity from some other planet pulls it in one direction for another. But if that doesn't happen, it'll keep moving. So if object is at rest, it's sitting still, it's going to remain sitting still unless something happens to it. If an object is moving, it's going to keep moving at that exact same speed unless something happens to it. So it takes force, it takes uh, exerting a force in order to change the motion of an object. To speed something up or slow it down or make it change direction or move it from where it is, that requires force. So that's kind of what the first law is all about. We have to have some sort of force exerted on an object in order to get it to change its movement. So I mentioned in the definition of the first law that it'll remain at rest or it'll remain moving until acted on by an unbalanced force. But what does that mean? Why can't I just say force? What does that mean, unbalanced force? So if we have four, two different forces on an object that are equal and opposite in direction, that means that they are balanced. So for example, like I mentioned, my computer is sitting on my desk or like a physics textbook sitting on a table. Gravity is going to pull that book or that computer down. Right. If there is no desk under my computer, it would just fall down to the ground. 
But since there is this desk or this table here, it's exerting a force up to keep that computer in place. All right, so the computer or the book in this example wants to go to the ground, but there is a table balancing that downward force and preventing that book or that computer from going down. So in physics, we would say the table is exerting an upward force on a book. It's not like actively pushing or pulling it, but it's forcing the book to not fall to the ground, if you want to think of it that way. So in this case, these forces are completely balanced. The force that the table is exerting on the book to keep it in place is exactly equal to the force exerted by the book on the table by gravity to go down. So they are completely balanced, equaled out. It's like if you have two people on either side of a tug of war and they both are pulling exactly equally the rope apart from each other, that rope isn't going to move one way or the other. It's going to stay exactly in the middle. So that's what we mean by balanced forces. We have equal forces in both directions. If there is not an equal force, if the forces are unbalanced, that is when the motion of the object changes. So say I come in to my computer and I unbalance the forces by putting more upward force on the computer. That causes it to get raised up into the air because now I'm exerting an unbalanced force on the computer. Or if I slowly decrease the force, now gravity is overcoming my arms and the computer goes down uh, back onto the table. So we only get movement when we have some sort of unbalanced force. We only have change when there is an unbalanced force. Otherwise, the first law says that the object will stay exactly as it is until that unbalanced force acts on it. So sometimes Newton's first law is also called the law of inertia. And inertia is essentially just a big fancy science word stating that objects tend to re resist changes in its state of inertia. And specifically, the more, let's see, I'd like, uh, let's do uh, red today. The more mass an object has, so the heavier it is, if it weighs a lot of grams or a lot of kilograms, the more inertia it has, which is a fancy way, fancy science way of saying that the more inertia means that it is harder to change its motion. So inertia is essentially saying how likely an object is to resist being moved. So if you have something fairly small and light, like my laptop or like this pen, for example, it's hard to see because I have my background screen on. But this pen has very low inertia. It's very light. It's easy for me to move it all around, to throw it onto the table. It's very easy for me to change its motion. Now, if you imagine something like a boulder or a bowling ball or something, those have lots of inertia. So if a big boulder is sitting in your yard and you want to move it, it's going to be hard for you to just go up and push that boulder out of the way, right? Because it's super heavy. It really, really wants to stay sitting still. It's going to have a lot of resistance to you changing its motion. Same thing for if somebody, if for whatever reason you're on the wrong side of a bowling alley, and somebody rolls a bowling ball at you really fast, 
you could sit there and try to stop the bowling ball from hitting you. And maybe if it was like a baseball or a tennis ball, that would be fine. It would be pretty easy to stop. Bowling balls are very heavy. Again, lots of mass. So a bowling ball is going to be very resistant to you changing it going from moving to not moving. It does not want you to stop it. It has a lot of inertia going on. So it's just gonna keep going at its same speed for a while. It's gonna be hard to change the movement of that bowling ball because it has so much mass. So inertia depends on mass. The more mass that you have, the more inertia that you have, and the harder it is to change the motion of that object. So things that are relatively small and light, like this pen or a tennis ball, have low inertia, whereas things that are big and heavy, like, I don't know, a car or a person even, have high inertia, right? If your 250 pound cousin is charging at you full speed ahead, it's probably better to get out of his way than to sit there and to try and stop him. So that's why a lot of like running backs and stuff in the NFL, and especially like the offensive and defensive linemen, it helps them to be really, really big and muscular because the bigger and heavier that they are, the harder it is for people to stop them. The harder it is for people to move them out of the way. Any questions about the first law or the idea of inertia so far. All right. Uh, so again, today we're really getting into the physics side of IPC. So we're gonna be talking all about motion and movement and these laws made up by this guy, Isaac Newton, that are kind of the fundamental rules for how things move. Let's see, okay, the drawing is gonna go away. Whoop. So we talked about mass and inertia. More mass means more inertia, means harder to move. So like if you have these two buckets right here, one of them is just an empty metal bucket, not too heavy. One of them is filled up on the inside with sand. So all of a sudden this guy is like two or three times heavier than the empty guy. So because the sandy bucket is heavier, it has more inertia and it's gonna be harder to push that bucket and cause it to swing versus the light bucket, all right? This guy, you could probably do like two or three fingers and just whoop, and it would start swinging back and forth. The sand guy, you'd probably have to really give a good shove in order to get some motion going on. And once they do start going, then it's gonna be a lot easier to grab and stop the empty bucket versus the full bucket. All right, talked about bowling balls and tennis balls. So if your elementary school math teacher was charging at you and a bull elephant was charging at you, obviously the elephant is a lot bigger and more massive than the little teacher guy. I don't know why he just struck me as looking like a old teacher from back in the day. So the elephant has a lot more inertia than the human which means that it's a lot more difficult to get the elephant to change its movement than to get the human 
to change its movement. So more inertia means harder to move. Do, do, do. So again, if something like big, like a boulder is rolling at you, it's gonna be hard to slow it down or speed it up, right? There's not much you can do to make it go faster or slower if it has a lot of inertia. If it's sitting still and it's really heavy, it's gonna be really hard to make it start moving if it's not moving already. And it'll also be hard to make it change direction. So not only can you not make it go faster or slower, it'll also be really hard to make something with a lot of inertia change direction. It's going to be going one way and it's going to take a lot of force to get it to move. So here's a good example. So seatbelts are extremely important for safety while you are in the car. And our little movie here shows why. When you and a car are traveling down the road, you're both traveling at, say you're on the highway, so you're doing 65 miles an hour, right? Or in this case, 80 kilometers an hour. So you and the car are both moving at 80 kilometers an hour down the road, right? You can look out the window and you see the trees and the stoplights and stuff buzzing by you. And so imagine that you're sitting in your car. You don't have your seatbelt on because you're a bad person who likes to live dangerously. And all of a sudden your car hits something and it causes it to come to a very abrupt stop. Maybe it's a wall or a tree or the other car. So the force of the wall on the car causes the car to go from 80 kilometers an hour to zero kilometers an hour very quickly. However, you still have some inertia, right? You are an object made up of mass. And if you're a human, that means you probably have at least 60 or 70 kilograms of mass on you. And so it's hard for that motion to change because of your mass. So even though the car is stopped, you are gonna keep going forward because your inertia says that you're gonna keep moving until something causes you to stop. Unfortunately, when people don't wear their seatbelts, this something becomes the car windshield or if you can even be thrown out of the car and it'll be the other cars on the road or the road itself, or a tree, or something like that, that stops you. Which is obviously very bad to hit those things at 80 kilometers an hour. So when you have your seatbelt on, that basically holds you in place, and as soon as the car stops, is stopped by that wall, your seatbelt will also exert a force on you to cause you to lose your inertia and slow down to eventually a stop. So inertia is why this little dude keeps moving forward even though the car stops. Because inertia says that if you have mass, you're going to keep moving in a certain direction until some sort of outside force causes you to stop moving. If you're wearing a seatbelt, that outside force will be the seatbelt across your chest. If you're not wearing a seatbelt, that outside force might be the car windshield or the wall or tree that you hit. So don't believe people who say, oh, I heard that like wearing your seatbelt is even more dangerous because it does a lot more damage. No, as your science teacher, I can tell you unequivocally that is false. There are tons of studies that have all proven that seatbelts reduce, reduce the risk of injury and death when worn while you're traveling in a car. So inertia is also why if 
there's something like you're doing some yard work and you move your wheelbarrow out to your garden and you fill it up with a whole bunch of bricks and weeds and stuff and then you go to move it away suddenly it's a lot harder to get that wheelbarrow to start going right because it's got all this extra inertia now because of all the mass that you've added to the wheelbarrow same thing like our example earlier it's a lot easier to stop a car going 55 miles an hour than it would to be like a big rig 18 wheeler truck the truck has a lot more mass and so it's going to be harder for that truck to stop I heard something on the radio today that I hadn't heard for a long time, and it was a public safety advertisement about not stopping on railroad tracks or thinking that you can get on across the railroad even when the guard is down because the train is way down there. And it mentioned that a train, so a full-size train with all those cars on it has tons and tons of inertia. So the ad mentioned that it can take a train up to an entire mile to come to a complete stop after the conductor applies the brakes. And that's because the train is so huge and massive, it has so much inertia that it takes a lot of force and a lot of time for that force to bring the train to a stop. So another, Super simple example. Again, you have that wheelbarrow, you filled it up with stuff, and then your rake, you put on top of it, just kind of laid it down on top, and you're rolling along, and then all of a sudden, oop, your wheel hits a rock, and you and the rake both like lurch forward, and the rake keeps moving and falls off your wheelbarrow. So your wheelbarrow stopped because it had this rock down here that exerted a force back on the wheelbarrow and stopped it from moving forward. The rake doesn't have any sort of force to stop it. So it slides right off the top of your wheelbarrow because it was traveling in that direction. And it's gonna keep traveling in that direction until some sort of force acts on it and causes it to stop. So again, first law says that if you set up a golf ball on a tee and then never do anything to it, that golf ball is just gonna sit there forever until something happens to it, until the wind blows it off or you hit it with your golf club or you kick it with your foot because you get really angry because you keep missing it with your golf club. But until some sort of force acts on that ball, it's gonna stay still. So earlier, I mentioned that if you went up to space and threw a tennis ball through space, it would keep traveling at that exact same speed and direction until it collided with like an asteroid or a planet or something like that. And I've been talking about how things in motion are gonna stay in motion until they get acted upon by this force. So down here on Earth, the reason why if you roll a ball across your carpet, it'll roll for a couple feet and then stop. And you might say, wait a second, I didn't see any forces acting on that ball. Why didn't it keep moving? What caused that ball to stop? It's usually a combination of two things. The first one is the biggest one is called friction. So friction is what happens when two different objects rub together. The other major force that causes things on Earth to slow down is gravity. If you throw a baseball straight up into the air, it's not gonna just keep going up into the air at the same speed forever, right? It immediately starts to slow down and then it stops for a teeny second and then it falls back downwards. And that's due to the force of gravity. So friction and gravity together 
are why things on Earth usually do not keep moving at the same speed forever and ever. They are unbalanced forces that cause objects to slow down or change direction. So there are a couple different types of friction. You don't have to know the names of these. They're just some examples. Uh, but some of the biggest examples are things like rolling friction. So the reason why when you're driving a car on the road, you constantly have to have your foot a little bit on the gas pedal and even in order to keep it at a certain speed is because when you take your foot off the gas, there's friction between your tires and the road. Same sort of friction you get if you roll a ball or throw a bowling ball down the alley. So that friction over time causes your car to slow down, to slow down, to slow down, to slow down, to finally, it would eventually stop if you didn't have on the little thing or when you put it in drive, it starts to scoot it forward at like one mile an hour. If that wasn't there, eventually after you took your foot off the brake, your car would come to a complete stop because of the friction between the wheel and the ground is essentially an unbalanced force pulling your car back a tiny bit. There's also a lot of friction in the air and especially in water. So have you ever been swimming and you're ready to get out and you have to go walk over to the stairs? It takes you like a couple seconds to kind of awkwardly scoot yourself over to the stairs, right? Because there's all this water that you're having to like kind of push out of your way as you're walking. The same thing happens in air. So if you ever stuck your hand out of the car at 60 miles an hour, you can feel the wind pushing against it and it'll start pushing your hand back, right? Because as your car is going across the road, it's moving through all of the air in front of it, which does cause some friction. Not a lot compared to the friction on the ground or the friction if you are in water, but it's still there. Same thing when you're on a bicycle. Friction is always kind of a force acting in reverse of the direction you're traveling. So here we have a person sitting still on their bike. So the net force is zero. They're not moving. And so they're not changing direction or moving any faster or slower. They're sitting still, essentially. So there's a balance of forces between the bike and the road and the person and gravity pulling them to the ground. If they start pedaling really fast, now there's no longer a balanced set of forces, right? They're putting more force going forward than there is friction holding them back. So the bike will start accelerating, right? You'll start going faster and faster because you're putting force in to the bike. You're changing its motion with your force on the pedals down here. Now again, like we mentioned, if you stop pedaling, even if it was on a perfectly 100% flat piece of ground, if you stop pedaling, eventually you're gonna slow down and come to a stop. And that's due to the force of friction between the road and your bike tires. You can make yourself slow down even faster by applying the handbrake. So I don't know if you've ever seen brakes, but when you squeeze the little trigger, there is these little pads that come and clamp the side of your bike wheel. Those pads create a lot of friction which produces a force in the opposite direction that you're going. So if initially when you're pedaling, your force is going to the right, the friction is going to be pulling you to the left. When this happens, you have more backwards friction force than you do forwards pedaling force. 
So you're going to slow down, deaccelerate, or have negative acceleration. It's not a balanced force anymore because instead of speeding up and going forward, you're slowing down and going backwards. So this is why when things on Earth move at a constant velocity, they usually don't stay that way for very long because of things like friction and gravity acting against that movement. So that's why I gave the example out in space earlier. Because in space, there's no air. So there's no friction between the air and the object. And the object is not rolling over anything. It's not on the ground. So there's no friction between the ground and the object. So something like a tennis ball or a rocket ship, if they're away from any sorts, sources of gravity or friction, if they start going a certain speed and nothing changes, they would keep going at that same speed in that same direction forever. And that's what the first law says. If there's no unbalanced forces like friction or gravity, then an object in motion will stay in motion forever. Mm. Uh, momentum is kind of similar to uh, inertia, um, but I think we're going to skip talking about momentum for today. There is a momentum formula. We're not going to worry about it. You don't need to know it. So we'll kind of hop over that. So before we get into the second law of motion, anybody have any final questions about the first law, objects at rest, inertia, friction, any first law questions? I'm good. All right. So the Newton's second law is a little bit more straightforward than the first law. And it can essentially be summed up with a very, very basic math equation. One thing that you notice about science and especially about physics is that the more you get into it, the more math that there is. So Newton's second law says force equals mass times acceleration. F equals m times a. So essentially, you can figure out how much force is either being exerted on an object or by an object by measuring the mass of that object times the acceleration that that object goes through. And acceleration is just how quickly something speeds up or slows down. There you go. So a change in speed and direction is acceleration. You can have positive acceleration where you're increasing your speed, or you can have negative acceleration or deceleration where you're decreasing your speed. So F equals M times A. So this isn't meant to be an X, it's meant to be a times. It's a multiplication. Force equals mass times acceleration. So there are a couple basic principles that Newton's second law describes. One of the things that comes out of that equation is if you apply more force to an object, it will accelerate at a higher rate, right? So if the mass is the same, so in this case, we've got a guy pushing this cart with a single little box on it. And so our equation, F equals MA, is 
f equals m times a. So if our mass stays the same, right, we have the same object, then our equation says that if you increase the force that you put on something, you'll increase the acceleration of that object. You'll cause it to speed up more quickly. So you can do a little push on this cart and it'll speed up a little bit and travel a little distance, or you can put a lot of force on this car's cart and cause it to speed up a whole lot. So that's one thing that our second law can tell us about force and acceleration. On the flip side, there we go. If we have the same object, but it has two different masses. So say we have a cart with one object on it and then a cart with a whole bunch of objects on it. If we increase the mass that is there, that means that in order to get the same acceleration, in order to get it to speed up the same amount, we have to apply more force. Right? Again, makes a lot of sense. If you have a light object and a heavy object, you'll need to push or pull that heavy object with more force in order to get it to speed up the same amount as the lighter object. So more mass means more force needed to get that acceleration. So again, if we want to get something to accelerate faster, we have to apply more force. Or if we want a heavier object with more mass to accelerate the same, we need to apply more force to that object as well. So force equals mass times acceleration has a whole bunch of ways you can think about it with real world objects. So like soccer, for example, the soccer ball has a certain amount of mass. And so when a soccer player kicks the ball, they're exerting a force on the ball, which is a certain mass. And so that force will cause the ball to accelerate. Again, the ball will always have the same mass. So if they're just passing it to a nearby teammate and they only want it to accelerate a little bit, they'll give it a small kick with little force. Or if they're trying to kick it into the goal and they want it to scream on past the goalie, they're gonna put in a lot of force which will cause it to accelerate very, very quickly. So you can also think about this in kind of the opposite direction, right? Say instead of these two carts being pulled by you, say they're already moving and you're going to have to exert a force to stop them. And so depending on the mass and the acceleration of the objects, that'll determine essentially what force that they hit you with, right? So if we've got 
this heavy cart and this light cart. And they both hit you and they were traveling at the same speed. So that means that when they hit you, they de-accelerate, right? So we go, we have a big, we have a change in acceleration from say, I don't know, say these guys are moving at like 10 kilometers per hour. So not super fast to zero. That's still a change in speed, which is acceleration. All right, so they're gonna de-accelerate when they hit you because of the force that you're exerting on each other. So the heavier object is going to exert more force on you than the lighter object, right? The heavier that something is, the harder that it's gonna hit you if they're both traveling at the same speed. On the flip side, if they're traveling at different speeds, so let's go back to This example. If say this guy was really mean and there was a person right here that he was getting ready to push this cart into, like they're filming some sort of dumb YouTube prank that requires them to hit each other with these carts. These carts both weigh the same Right, we said that they have the same mass. But our cart down here is moving faster. So because this cart is moving faster, that means that when it hits this person, so let's say up here we have a cart going at 10 to zero. And this cart is going from 15 to zero. This cart had a bigger change in acceleration compared to this cart. So the mass is the same, but the A is bigger, which means that the force on our poor person over here about to get hit is bigger for this person down here and smaller for this person up here. So a bigger change in acceleration going from a higher speed to a low speed all of a sudden also means more force being applied, right? That's why things like bullets are so deadly. Bullets have a very low mass, but when a bullet traveling at a couple hundred miles an hour slams into your stomach, it has a huge change in acceleration. So it exert, exerts a huge force on your internal organs and it does a lot of damage. So even though the mass is very small, like if you had a bullet in your hand and you threw it at somebody, that's not gonna hurt very much, right? It's not gonna do a lot of damage. But when it comes out of the gun and hits you, it has such a high change in acceleration that it has this huge force that goes along with it. All right, so any questions about Newton's second law or what the equation force equals 
mass times acceleration means. Alrighty. Well, I think that just about brings us to the end of today. So tomorrow, and by tomorrow, I mean Thursday, obviously. On Thursday, we'll get more into Newton's third law about equal and opposite reactions or forces on one another. Um, so the assignments for this week are super straightforward. We're getting to kind of the last weeks of class. And so I just wanted to ask a couple basic laws of motion question. And so the Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday assignments are essentially just simple questions about the three different laws of motion that we're going to be covering, just to make sure that you guys kind of got a basic understanding of it. So just like all the other questions, you can answer this on the Google Classroom and just submit your answer. And that is all you'll have to do. There's not going to be like a big worksheet or a big uh, assignment for any one of these questions. All right, where's the button I'm looking for? Here it is. So any final question about the laws of motion? That first law about inertia and movement and balanced forces, or the second law about force, mass, and acceleration? I'm good. I'm 